Hello and welcome to a test or study guide on atomic theory. I have designed this to kind of reflect back on the lessons that I've taught for atomic theory. You can use it as a study guide if you have an upcoming classroom test with your regular teacher, or if you're learning chemistry on your own, this would be a great way for you to pause, answer some questions, and kind of score yourself and see how you've done. Each of the questions is going to be headed by a unit, which is two, and then a lesson number. It'll correspond to a video inside of my channel. And there, if you find that something is just like weird and doesn't make sense, you can definitely go back and uh, check on yourself, go watch the video again, relearn it, and then come back here and answer those questions again to make sure that you're really feeling solid on the content. You have been asked to give a quick synopsis and to draw a picture of each of the models of the atom. Um, here they are listed, the electron cloud model, the Rutherford model, Bohr, Thompson, Dalton, and Democritus. Make sure to pause the video, answer the questions, and then hit play to see how you did. All right, so the electron cloud model fits right here. This is it in the lower left. It has a positive nucleus. The electrons are in clouds as represented by this fuzzy watercolor type cloud. Um, it's based on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that tells us that we can't know where an electron is and how fast it's moving at the same time. And it's based on the work of lots of different scientists. Not only is it Heisenberg, it's also some guy, De Broglie, and I know that's not how you say his name, but that's how it's spelt, so that's how I say it. Um, there's also Albert Einstein and Max Planck, whose name is spelt Planck. Um, those guys and plenty of others have contributed to the modern or the electron cloud model of the atom. Backwards chronological, we have the Bohr model, which is here in the center, uh, where we have a positive nucleus, and then we have energy levels that hold electrons. He called them orbits or orbitals. Electrons had a specific home in one of those orbitals, um, and it was to lock them in place so that they didn't just collide into the nucleus because they're attracted to each other. He stated that electrons could jump up to higher energy levels if you gave them the right amount of energy. And he measured that amount of energy by figuring out how much light those electrons were giving back when they returned from their high excited state to their low standard ground state. That energy that's emitted is in the form of light and those spectral lines we can use to identify electrons or identify elements. In the top right, we have the Rutherford model. Rutherford found his evidence for the model of the atom by doing the gold foil experiment. Um, in that gold foil experiment, most of the alpha particles launched at the gold foil went straight through the foil, which indicated to him that the atom is mostly empty space. And because some of those particles kind of went into the gold foil and then went out to the side, he knew that there was something positive inside the atom because his alpha radiation was positive. So it was clearly avoiding something. Positive will avoid positive. And that happened such a small percentage of the time, plus the small amount of particles that went in and bounced back. He knew that the nucleus was really tiny. So... His model of the atom looks something like this with a positive nucleus in the center. This yellow area would all be empty space and the electrons are kind of just floating around haphazardly. Then we have, again, going backwards in time, we have J.J. Uh, Thompson and the plum pudding model of the atom. He found the electrons using a cathode ray tube and found that um, atoms were actually made of smaller pieces. He called them subatomic particles. This told us that atoms were made of smaller parts. Because there were negatives that he had found, the electrons, um, he assumed that the atom itself was a positive mass with negative electrons distributed throughout, kind of looking like a chocolate chip cookie, although he called it the plum pudding model. A little ways before that, probably around 100-ish years, this uh, Dalton model of the atom was what we thought atoms were. And that is that atoms are... indivisible, meaning that you can't cut them into smaller pieces. That was obviously disproven by Thompson a little while later, but for a while we were working with the Dalton model. He knew that atoms would combine to form molecules or elements would combine to form compounds. He knew that 
uh, compounds or substances that were made out of the same elements weren't necessarily the same. For example, if you think of H2O and H2O2, they have different amounts of the same ingredients, which made them different. And he called that the law of definite proportion. Um, so having two oxygens made hydrogen peroxide very, very, very different from water with just one oxygen. He knew that atoms of the same element would react the same way, perform the same way. He thought they were identical. Um, we found out later with the discovery of isotopes that that wasn't necessarily the case, but he didn't know it at the time. Um, so he thought all carbons were like all other carbons and all oxygens were like all other oxygens, but oxygens were not like carbons and carbons were not like oxygens. So he kind of gave um, atoms a little bit more personality than its original um, thought creator, and that was Democritus. His model of the atom pretty much looked the same as Dalton's. Um, so he says that matter is made out of atoms, super, super tiny particles, that you could cut a substance into a lot of pieces, and eventually you'd come to a piece that couldn't be cut. It was indivisible, and he called that atomos. Um, he didn't necessarily realize that different... Um, he did know that different types of matter had different properties, but he didn't really realize that there were chemical elements. He was thinking that there were natural elements of like earth, wind, fire, whatever, um, and that different combinations of those would give you different things. Okay, lesson 2.2 on atomic structure. I'm asking you to fill out this table. Okay, you should have filled it out something like this. Protons are positive. Their symbol is P with a plus sign. They are living in the nucleus and they are going to give you the identity of your atom via the atomic number. If an atom has six protons, I know that it's carbon. If it has 35, I know it's bromine. And that is because the atomic number is the number of protons and that is what tells you the identity of the atom. Then we have neutrons with no charge at all. It's often represented by a zero with a slash through it. Uh, neutrons live in the nucleus and their primary purpose is to prevent protons from repelling, but they also are going to be a big determinant of the mass in um, an isotope. Lastly, we have electrons and electrons have a negative charge often represented by E minus. They live in orbits or clouds energy levels. It kind of depends on which model of the atom you're talking about. Um, and they control the behavior of atoms. If you have um, a certain number of electrons, your atom is going to react in a certain way. And that is all because of the electrons. Okay, step three. I'm sorry, it's really tedious. Um, I need you to write the steps for drawing a Bohr model. And then I need you to draw a Bohr model for potassium, whose symbol is K, I'll spoil it for you a tiny bit. Potassium's atomic number is 19. I'll be honest with you, this one was pretty much a nightmare. <laughs> Look at that thing. Um, okay, so the first thing you're gonna do is determine the number of protons using the periodic table. Because potassium has a, an atomic number of 19, there are 19 protons. Um, there should be 19 pluses in my nucleus if I counted correctly. I did count and then count again, so. There should be 19 there. The second thing that you're gonna do is take the mass on the periodic table and round it to a whole number. So for potassium, its mass is 39.10, meaning that the closest whole number is 39. That's its mass number. Then we are going to subtract from 39 the number of protons, 19. So potassium should have 20 neutrons. Then lastly, potassium has 19 electrons, and I know that they are going to be organized into four energy levels because potassium has, uh, it's in the fourth period of the periodic table. And then using the periodic table as a tool, I'm gonna figure out how many electrons go into each of the orbitals. So in the first energy level, there are two electrons because there's two elements in the first period. Then in the second level, there are eight electrons because there are eight elements in the second period. So, so far, potassium has 10 electrons. In the third energy level, there's going to be eight electrons because there are 
eight elements in the third period of the periodic table, which is started out by sodium. That brings us to 18 total electrons. And then finally, the fourth energy level is going to be just one for the 19th electron. Also, potassium um, is fourth period, and it's the first element there, so it's going to have one electron in the fourth energy level. And your drawing should look something like this, um, and Bohr models are kind of a nightmare, which is why Lewis structures exist. So I would love for you, again, to pause, write the directions for the atomic Lewis structures, for drawing a Lewis structure, and then draw Lewis structures for potassium, calcium, oxygen, and helium. Okay, the steps for drawing a, an atomic Lewis structure or the Lewis structure for an atom is to find the element symbol on the periodic table and then using the group number, the vertical column on the periodic table, find out the number of valence electrons. Now, I gave you potassium and calcium from groups 1 and 2 and then oxygen and helium from groups 16 and 18. I did not give you any from the center section because those elements don't follow the rules. They're not super predictable, but we'll talk more about them later in a future video. Um, so once you find out the number of valence electrons, you are going just to draw those dots around an imaginary box on the element until you have all of the electrons you need. Potassium is a member of group one, so it has one valence electron. Calcium is a member of group two with two valence electrons. Oxygen is in 16 with six valence electrons. And then helium is a little bit weird because it's a member of group 18, and all of the members of group 18 have eight valence electrons except for helium. Helium is too small, so it'll only have two valence electrons. For less than 2.5 on isotopes, you should be able to fill out this data table. And here is that data table. I will go over um, neon and potassium for you, which were the last two. So for neon, we were only given the isotopic notation. Uh, this number on the bottom, the 10, represents the number of protons, but it also represents the atomic number. And for atoms, it also represents the number of electrons. Secondly, is uh, the 20, which represents the mass number, which is the sum of the protons and neutrons. In order to find the number of neutrons, you would do the top number minus the bottom number or the mass number minus the atomic number. In this case, it just happens to be the same. It's a coincidence. Isotopic notation is always followed by the element symbol. And then to write that out, we have the element's name and the mass number. Now for potassium, that one was a little bit tougher because you had the name of the element and its mass number. So you could fill in the mass number really easily and the mass number on top, again, super easy. But you had to know that potassium had the symbol K, which is really weird. It comes from Latin, that's why it's strange. So this K right here is the symbol for potassium. And when you look up that symbol on the periodic table, Potassium has the atomic number 19. That represents the number of protons as well. Then finally, you would do 40 minus 19 to come up with the number of neutrons. Again, that's the mass number minus the number of protons. So in this case, potassium has 21 neutrons. You can follow the same patterns for the rest of this data table. And now we're going to move on to average atomic mass. So first, you should define average atomic mass, and then you should show the setup for calculating average atomic mass of silicon. You should, when you solve it, come out to data that either exactly matches or is super close to the periodic table. Average atomic mass is defined as the weighted average of all of the naturally occurring isotopes of an element, meaning that number one, we're only averaging in the isotopes that we find in nature, nothing that is man-made. It is also a weighted average, which means that the percent abundance or how popular this atom is in nature is taken into consideration when we calculate the average. So there's two ways to set this up. The first is kind of just like a copy and paste of the data. You would take the mass of the isotope and multiply it by its percent abundance. And some of you are going to like to um, 
just take the percent abundance as it is and drop it into this equation, which is fine. Um, then you would add that number to the second isotope's mass times its abundance and then add that to the next isotope. And then this can go on and on. It's a dot, dot, dot. You can have four or five isotopes. Um, and if you just copy the percentage into the equation, you'll have to divide the whole thing by 100 to get rid of the percent sign. Um, so that's the first way to set it up. The second way to set it up is to take all of your percent abundances and immediately convert them into decimals, which I prefer to do just because I can drop all of this in the calculator in one step a lot easier. The parentheses get tricky if you try to do this all in one step. At least for me, it does. Um, so again, you would take the mass times the percent abundance as a decimal plus the mass times the percent abundance as a decimal plus the mass times the percent abundance as a decimal. And again, this should come out to something super close to the periodic table. For electron excitation, we have a heck of a lot of questions. The first asks to define the following terms, ground state and excited state, and then answer, how do electrons move within an atom? How can energy be added to atoms? What forces do electrons have to overcome to be able to move within an atom? And what is the result of electrons returning to stable energy conditions from high energy conditions? Ground state is defined as the lowest energy state for an electron or as close to the nucleus as it can get. The excited state is where electrons can jump to if they get enough energy to jump to those levels. Electrons move within an atom when energy is added to that atom. And again, it has to be just the right amount of energy. Energy can be added to atoms by heating them or providing electricity. Electrons will need to overcome their attraction to the nucleus to be able to move up to higher energy levels within an atom. Lastly, electrons release energy when they return to their stable energy conditions, the ground state, from their high energy conditions, the excited state. So that's what I have. Let me know what your score is. Leave it in the comment section below the video. Leave any questions you have there too. Uh, subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson. We're going to start periodic table next. Hope to see you there. Bye.